All right. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we didn't expect such a full room. Um, so this session will be uh, both an introduction and a deep dive into Thanos. Um, so the first part, we're going to do like an overview of Thanos, what it is, how you run it. And then in the second part, we'll cover some of the um, improvements that have been done recently. And then we'll talk about some more exciting stuff, some concrete use cases and so on. Maybe just a quick show of hands. Um, how many people here run Thanos in production already? Okay, that's so for you, you might find the first part a bit boring, but maybe you'll also learn something new. Um, before we get started, uh, just a quick round of introductions. My name is Philip. I'm a production engineer at Shopify. I work in the infrastructure team. I'm also part of the Thanos maintainers team, and also in the past, I helped maintain Prometheus operator and kubestate metrics. Uh, and with me today is uh, Saswata. Um, yes, so my name is Shashwata Mukherjee. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, where I work on an internal monitoring platform. I'm also a maintainer of Thanos and was previously a GSOC mentee under the same project. I also help maintain a couple of CNCF adjacent uh, projects like MDocs and Observatorium. Um, you can find me as, uh, at Saswata Mkod on Twitter, GitHub, or pretty much anywhere else. All right. Um, okay, so now getting into the good stuff. Um, it's kind of hard to talk about Thanos without mentioning Prometheus first. Um, Prometheus, I expect most of you to be to have heard at least about it. It's a standalone monitoring si a server or system that you drop in your environment, very close to your applications. Prometheus, they scrapes metrics from applications. Um, and then stores them locally. So Prometheus doesn't have any external dependencies, which means you can't actually offload metrics data into an external database. Um, and as a result, it has to store uh, those metrics on disk. It also has like a very flexible query language, which we call PromQL. And using that query language, we can also write alerts, which means um, we can have alerts that are constantly executed and they let us know when something goes wrong. When, if, a, for example, a threshold is violated, uh, Prometheus can fire an alert. And so if we um, zoom into the Prometheus design and what it's composed of, we see um, four kind of key modules which are present in the Prometheus code base and functionality, which are very relevant for what Thanos is, um, for what we'll be speaking today. Uh, so we have the rule manager, which executes alerting rules. We have the query engine, which executes PromQL. Uh, then we have the time series database, um, which Prometheus uses to store metrics on disk. And it also has a, something called a compactor, which optimizes the layout of, of metrics on disk over time. Um, and so if we were to now um, use Prometheus to monitor various environments, um, we would have to deploy like at least one Prometheus instance per environment. Uh, Prometheus cannot handle like a large uh, multi-environment setup. And so this, we can, this can work, like Prometheus will take care of each individual cluster, for example. Uh, but uh, very quickly we see that we won't be able to get something that we call a global view of the data. So we won't be able to query metrics across environments or across Kubernetes clusters, or maybe across namespaces. Um, we also won't be able to retain data for a long period of time because of the local storage constraints. So disks can be hard to move, ar move around or they can be expensive. We want to retain data for a year, for example, and so on. Um, also, the, the resolution that Prometheus has, it, it's going to scrape every 30 seconds. And if we want to execute a query across, say, um, three months of data or six months of data, that resolution is going to be very dense and very high. Um, so uh, a query of that duration is going to be very challenging to execute. And so this is where uh, Thanos comes in. This is um, These are the gaps that Thanos as a system tries to fill out. Um, it uh, has uh, features such as a global view, uh, long-term retention has um, downsampling built in over time, so it can reduce the resolution uh, of scraped samples. Um, has also some nice multi-tenancy features and so on. So um, starting kind of with a global view, how Thanos solves this global view problem. Uh, and um, maybe before we kind of explain how it does it, it's worth mentioning what a global, what we mean by a global view. 
So if we were to have a set of Prometheus instances and we were to execute a query, we really want that query to be executed across the entire fleet. So if we want to say, give me a sum over a given metric, we really want the sum across for all Prometheus instances. Um, and so the way that we do it is Thanos basically takes out this module called PromQL from, from Prometheus, bundles that into a standalone service that can be run and scaled independently. Uh, and then uh, that's, and in addition to this, we also define something that we call the store API. And as you can see here, the second RPC, that's the serious RPC, which um, the querier can use to request time series data from any component. Um, and so since Prometheus doesn't actually understand this API, uh, what we do is in the Thanos ecosystem, we have something called the Thanos sidecar, which we deploy next to each Prometheus instance. The querier can then talk to the sidecar and the sidecar uh, takes data out of Prometheus. And by doing this, now the querier can connect to multiple Prometheus instances. So um, we would basically end up, if we were to uh, get a global view, we'd end up with something like this, where we have uh, multiple Prometheus instances, sidecar for each Prometheus instance, and a querier that's connected to all of the sidecars. And so now the querier is responsible for executing queries. And so by um, extension of this, by, by having this global view over the data, uh, we can now also have global alerting and global rule recording. So for example, if we want something like the global error rate across multiple environments, or we have an SLO for the P90 latency, we'd be able to do that with something that we call uh, the Thanos ruler. So yet again, we pull out the component from Prometheus, we take out the rule engine, which and we reuse a lot of the code from the from the rule engine. We package that into something that we call a Thanos ruler. The ruler is then connected to the querier, uh, and now through the querier, it has access to the entire dataset. And so, in our baby example from before, we can now, um, as mentioned, we can deploy a Thanos ruler. Uh, the ruler can talk, can be connected to the querier, and because the querier has a global view over the whole dataset the ruler back extension can uh, execute alerting rules across the entire data set. All right, uh, we also mentioned that it's kind of challenging to store data on disk for longer periods of time. It's also hard to move disks around. Um, and so for this purpose, um, the Thanos sidecar can be configured to upload data from Prometheus into object storage. So Prometheus is going to um, create data on disk every two hours by default. Um, the sidecar can then upload the data, that data to object storage. And then um, the Thanos store gateway can query the data from object storage directly. Um, and so the, both the store gateway and the sidecar now implement the same API. So the querier can talk to both of them. And so in our, again, if we extend our example from before, uh, we would configure both of these sidecars to upload data to, uh, for example, an S3 bucket, a GCS bucket. Uh, we would deploy the store gateway, which has the same uh, store API like the sidecar. And so the querier in this case would get the latest data uh, from Prometheus through the sidecars and would get historical data from um, the store gateway um, and directly um, getting to object storage. So there's two kind of important things to note here. The store gateway doesn't actually download data from object storage. It downloads a very small part of, of that particular data set. And then um, it uses, it, the, we call this an index header, and then it uses um, that index header to make further requests to object storage on demand as we query data. So we don't actually need all of these massive disks data can stay in object storage um, and we just need to download very small parts. Also, uh, both the store and the, uh, what we call here the compactor, which optimizes this, this, um, this data over time, have a UI. So if you were to visualize, if you wanted to get a, like a visual representation of what your data looks like, you can open the UI. And here we see, um, you know, we have these blocks, what we call blocks, they all have a time duration. Uh, some are two hour, uh, sorry, two day blocks, other are seven day blocks and so on. So as data comes in, the compactor merges these blocks and creates bigger blocks out of smaller blocks. Uh, also, this is a, like this is um, the compactor um, 
when it's doing its job, we get up to something like this, but then, you know, there are cases where the compactor would fall behind and we, would, we might see a situation where we have a bunch of small blocks in object storage. Um, this is um, just keeping in mind that, um, it's worth keeping in mind that having a situation like this is going to increase costs against object storage because we have to make simply more API calls. So monitoring the compactor, making sure that it's doing a good job is, is going to be important for both cost control, but also making sure that queries perform well. Um, okay, and finally, um, the last kind of component that's been added to the Thanos ecosystem um, is something that we call the Thanos receiver. Um, the reason why um, it exists is because the sidecar model might be problematic in certain cases. So if we have you know, hundreds of clusters, for example, we might not be able to open ports to all of these sidecars uh, or to all of these Prometheuses that are running all over the place. And so um, we have um, certain, cert certain situations where a global query or the root simply cannot connect to many, many different sidecars. And so for this reason, we've introduced something that we call the Thanos receiver, which um, is a kind of component with, to which metrics can be pushed to. So it's more of a push-based approach, essentially. And so what we have here on the right-hand side might be something like Prometheus agents, which are fairly lightweight. They, they can scrape metrics and remote write them to the receiver component. And then the querier, just like it can query the sidecar, can also query the receiver. Um, and by doing this, we get to, instead of a pull-based approach, to a push-based approach. And finally, um, these kind of uh, approaches are not mutually exclusive. You can use them both at the same time. So you can be pulling metrics from certain places, and you can also be pushing metrics from other places. Um, and this is kind of a fairly common scenario that people have. We also have a similar setup at Shopify um, where we kind of utilize all of these components in a fairly complex setup. Okay, so that was the, the overview, the introduction to Thanos. Uh, and now we'll look into some of the recent improvements. Okay, so with that detailed introduction out of the way, let's talk a bit about the several new features, improvements, and optimizations that the awesome Thanos community has been cooking up behind the scenes, um, starting with the diskless store gateway. So as Philip mentioned in the introduction, the store API acts as a sort of glue to fetch data from the various, uh, from the various Thanos backends. Uh, so the Thanos store gateway is one such uh, backend that basically acts as a caching layer and exposes the gRPC store API for fetching chunks from Prometheus format TSDB blocks in any object storage. So we use three distinct caches uh, to make this operation of fetching and querying uh, data from a historical TSDB much more performant for us. Um, firstly, we cache the meta.json file for each TSDB uh, block on disk alongside a small portion of the TSDB index file, which we call as index uh, header. And the index header is basically a truncated uh, TSDB index file. Um, we also, apart from that, we also maintain uh, an index cache and a caching bucket to cache the postings, series, and chunks from the TSDB blocks during the store API series RPC calls. But recently, with uh, larger and larger Thanos installations, which have hundreds of uh, historical TSDB blocks and object storage, and also need higher availability via multiple replicas, we have observed that uh, caching the index header files on disk becomes problematic and just simply unsustainable. Storing gateway startup time starts to slow down as the gateway needs to cache all the index header files during startup, um, and the disk fills up very quickly. Now, you could throw money at the problem and increase the size of the disk, but it is expensive and not very practical when you need to run multiple different replicas. Fortunately, there is now a solution for this, which is to just disable the uh, disable caching the index headers on the disk completely. Uh, this and that is the store gateway will now be stateless and not cache the index headers on disk, nor will it load from it. Um, and this still doesn't change the store gateway's internal memory representation. It will just create that on the fly during a particular query instead of referring back to the disk. Uh, 
So that's where this new feature enabled the Store Gateway uh, becomes fully stateless, and this makes it possible to run Store Gateway over hundreds of TSCB blocks in object storage uh, without having to pay for ultra expensive SSDs. And we still cache posting series and uh, chunks as we usually do. Uh, the next improvement that we'd like to talk about is the quality of service improvements for Thanos, especially for monitoring as a service use cases where you would be serving multiple different tenants. Um, so the meaning of quality of service in SaaS terms is simply the ability to provide uh, different priorities to different users or data flows and to guarantee a certain level of performance. And we want to make sure that a single tenant or user does not ruin and deteriorate services for other tenants. So in the context of Thanos, uh, there are basically two data flows for end users that we want to protect from disruptions, which, which are the read and uh, the write parts. So let's delve into them individually. So now consider a scenario where the, uh, in which the receive component is maybe deployed in a hashing configuration with multiple uh, different tenants remote writing metrics to it. Now, maybe you have scaled uh, the receive nodes to only be able to tolerate around 100k series from each tenant. Now, if a certain tenant starts to misbehave and send way more metrics than that, maybe a million series, you would start to face uh, disruptions in the form of ohms, and receive hash ring will start to lose stability. You then have a couple of different options for mitigating that. Uh, so you could use an HPA or a VPA setup that can scale your Thanos hash ring up to a certain point. But if a tenant writes even more uh, even more metrics than that, you likely are to um and crash loop again. You might want to scale infinitely, but again, that is not very practical or e economical. So the way we want to tackle uh, this problem is via granular uh, per tenant remote write limits that allow us to keep our write path completely disruption free by ensuring that we only ingest what we allow it to ingest. So with, this, uh, with these limits, every time a protobuf encoded remote write request comes in, we'll check if it is under our request size, under our request samples, and under our request series limits. And we also ensure that the tenant the remote write request is coming from is still below a certain number of head or active series, after which we allow it to be ingested into uh, the particular tenant's TSDP. The, the configuration for this limit ensures that you can set global defaults for the limiting configs and override those values per tenant on every single receive node. For the active series limit, uh, we directly query any Prometheus compatible meta monitoring endpoint to query the total number of head series for each tenant. Now, coming to the query path, the way it works is that a user can fire off a Promocule query to a querier, which can then call several store APIs and fetch data using the series RPC call. Now, if the store API happens to be a store gateway, then it also downloads data from object storage to fulfill that series RPC call. But in the case of two excessive queries that end up maybe selecting too much data or too many samples, we end up with a couple of different bottlenecks. Um, the querier can start to oom and crash if it ends up fetching too many samples and having to run from kill functions on top of them uh, to fulfill multiple different queries. The store gateway might also start to oom if it ends up having to download a lot of TSDB data from object storage to fulfill a single series RPC call. And as with everything, you can probably throw money at the problem again and scale up vertically and horizontally um, but that is not really economical or practical. So we ended up introducing limits at the store API level and the store gateway level that allow for more stability in these parts. So with these, we can set limits uh, on every store API implementation like receive, rule, or store gateway to limit the number of series and samples returned in a single series RPC call. This ensures that you have an upper limit on the total data that can be requested by a single prompt kill query. And with the already present query concurrency limit, you can even size your uh, Thanos queries accordingly. We also limit the um, downloaded bytes on the store gateway to ensure that fetching historical data from the TSDB does not, from the 
object storage TSTVs does not end up booming in. So with these limits in place, we end up having a pretty comfortable way of operating a multi-tenant monitoring as a service platform with Thanos and ensuring uh, some level of quality of service. Now let's also talk about another feature which makes the right path on Thanos substantially stabler than before, which is consistent hashing on receipts. So this was a feature which adds a new hashing mode to the Thanos receive component called Ketama, which enables very stable scale up and scale down scenarios. And it is now our recommended way of running Thanos receive hashing. So let us take a look into how this works. So uh, Ketama hashing is configured the same way as our old hash mask based hashing using hashring.json files on every single receive node to specify the topology. Uh, and we add a flag on each receive to uh, switch to Ketama mode. So in this mode, every receive node is assigned a section to manage within the hashring. And these sections are composed of a range of hashes. So when a new remote write request uh, is received by the receive node, we iterate through the time series present uh, in that request and hash the labels with the name of the tenant that the request came from. We then batch, uh, these, uh, batch and forward these time series to the sections, that is to the receive nodes that should ingest them. So with this, we ensure a stable ingest path that actually has consistent hashing and hence an even distribution of data for tenants across your receive nodes. Internally at Red Hat, we also use a Kubernetes controller, which is open sourced under the observatory mark, uh, which monitors stateful set configuration for your receives and the pod status and simultaneously ensures that the receive nodes have the correct updated hashring.json configs so that their internal representation of the receive topology is as close to the real world as possible. And this makes operating and scaling uh, set setups so much more uh, automated. Let's now segue into one of the greatest highlights for the past few months, which is the new multi-threaded PromQL query engine. So to provide you with a little bit of con context, uh, the Prometheus engine currently is a single threaded function that passes and traverses the query abstract syntax tree recursively and evaluates the query result alongside it, all at once before returning a result. So this is the PromQL engine that we all know and love, but due to the way distributed systems like Thanos are set up, it becomes difficult to query large sets of data uh, that are distributed across uh, different uh, networks. Um, not to mention being limited to a single thread uh, causes issues. So with that in mind, the Thanos PromQL engine project was started by Philip based on the Volcano query engine paper, which specifies the architecture for an extensible and parallel query engine that can utilize concurrency and multiple cores to its fullest and allow space for several different optimization techniques. Now, the current Volcano-based uh, PromQL engine works somewhat like this. Uh, it passes the query into an abstract syntax tree using the same upstream parser of Prometheus. It then tries to optimize the query expression by applying several logical plan optimizers for it. And once such logical plan optimizers have been applied, the query expression is somewhat simpler than it used to be. It traverses the AST again and uh, constructs a tree of executable operators. Uh, that is a physical query plan. The root of this operator tree can now be executed to fetch the final result of the PromQL query. And the operators themselves can use multiple threads or even run parallel to each other. So what do these operators look like? Well, essentially they implement uh, an interface like this and it has two important methods. Uh, the first of which is series which returns all the series that an operator will ever return in its lifetime. And this is useful for parent or upstream operators to allocate the buffers they would need uh, beforehand. The second is the next call, which returns the vectors of samples of all series for a particular e execution step. So every operator calls next and series on its child operators until there is no more data to be returned, that is until the query has reached leaves. Uh, 
Now we mentioned operators, so it's a good idea to also mention how the data flows between these operators. So as mentioned, the operators are arranged in a tree-like fashion where every operator calls next, and this sort of model allows for samples of an individual time series to flow from each execution step uh, from the leftmost to the right in this diagram. Since most PromQL uh, expressions are aggregations, the samples are reduced as they are pulled in by the operators from the right. And because of this, the samples can be decoded and kept in memory in patches. Aside from this, the operators, uh, aside from the operators that are a one-to-one -one mapping with uh, regular PromQL constructs, we also have some exchange operators that allow for flow control and concurrency. So let's see how that works. So we have enabled two types of parallelism between the operators. Um, the first one is inter-operator parallelism. So as the operators are independent and rely on a common interface, they can be run in parallel. So as soon as one operator has processed a batch of samples, they can be pulled in by the next. And then uh, the next thing is intra-operator parallelism. So where parallelism can be added within the individual operator using certain uh, coalesc special operators and they would be indistinguishable from regular ones as they pass on data using the same next call. So now that we know how it works to some extent on a much higher level, let's talk about benchmarking. So we have quite a lot of Go benchmarks for this project for benchmarking several different forms of queries, uh, both instant and range queries, against the original engine. And we run these on every commit domain on a CNCF-sponsored Equinix GitHub Actions runner. And we publish the results on a central web page for everyone to track. And finally, as this is an alternative downstream implementation of PromQL, let's talk a bit about how we maintain compatibility with the original engine. So we use a special compatibility engine flow which while uh, evaluating a uh, query checks if the new PromQL engine supports it. And if not, we fall back to the re regular Prometheus engine. So while most functions uh, have already been ported over, uh, such an approach ensures that even if the upstream spec changes, we would still end up being able to support it. And nearly all of our tests in this project test the new engine by comparing results between the upstream and the downstream engines and asserting on ma matches. Uh, all right, That's, that was a lot of information, right? Um, the something that we're uh, really excited to um, to be working on and that's going to end up in the next maybe several months is what we call distributed execution. Um, to explain why it's so important in Thanos, um, we can visualize this like small example where we have, so Thanos allows us to stack queries on top of each other. So we can have, for example, a cluster A, cluster B, they run Prometheus with sidecars and each cluster can have its own query. And then we can have a query at the root that's going, that's doing basically the federation and the global view. And so uh, today, if you execute something like a sum or an average or a count expression, what's going to happen is the root query is going to pull data um, through the queries on the second level. It's going to use them as proxies essentially, and it's going to pull all of the relevant time series in memory. Um, and execute the query in memory. So this is fairly wasteful because the second level queries are going to be doing very little work, even though they are capable of executing PromQL. So this has obviously scalability issues as we extend the environment, as we add more clusters, the root query becomes a bottleneck. So what we are aiming to do with distributed execution is um, the root query is going to decompose a query into what we call subqueries and it's going to push them down as low as possible in the query path. So in this case, um, the sum will become a sum over these two partitions, and then at the root, we'll do the sum of those sums. Um, and so by doing this, the every query in the query path is going to be utilized to its fullest, um, and queries will be able to run much faster and will be much more scalable, essentially. Also, the good thing is that any PromQL expression can be kind of decomposed this way. So for example, a count can be a sum over count, uh, a group can be a group over groups, a top K, a top K over top case, and so on. So there are very, there's maybe one or two aggregations in PromQL which cannot be done this way. So this is, again, super exciting, um, but still under development, we are still kind of figuring out some edge cases. <laughs> 
Um, and finally, um, there is something called native histograms, uh, a very powerful feature that's landing in, in uh, PromQL and in, in upstream Prometheus. Um, if you're interested in, in, how, in what native histograms are, how they work, uh, Ganesh and Bjorn from the Prometheus maintainers team, they have excellent talks. So make sure to check those out. But this is also a feature that we're pulling into Thanos because Thanos heavily borrows from Prometheus. Um, we have an issue that kind of tracks the development of that feature. So we expect it to land again in the next maybe several months. Um, all right, so then people um, also like very often have questions such as, you know, can Thanos scale to X, Y, Z, and always it's a, like a different metric. They have some different constraints or ideas uh, in mind what scalability means. Um, so in order to kind of set some sort of a bound, uh, at least a low round of where we know Thanos can perform adequately, um, I've basically taken a screenshot of one of our internal dashboards that we have at Shopify for in our internal monitoring, which shows the um, basically what we call the head series or the cardinality of the entire head, um, data set across the entire monitoring infrastructure. So this is how many time series we have globally uh, within the last two hours. That's that's the in the Prometheus parlance. That's what head series means. Um, so we see that um, here, obviously, cardinality varies. The the top panel shows the global one, um, but we are basically capable of getting anywhere between three billion and six billion uh, time series within you know a two hour window, which is fairly high. Uh, also, like if we break that down per region, we run Thanos in different regions. Uh, the two biggest regions, US East and US Central, they also spiked to about one point five billion. Um, and also, finally, like Thanos is not like a done project. We are still making constant improvements to it. There's still ongoing work, and there will be more work in the future. Um, just to kind of illustrate that, we had um, an environment when where the queries were simply not updated for any reason, and by simply updating them from uh, like a six-month-old version to the latest version, we saw approximately a 50% reduction in like both CPU and memory usage. And in addition to this, we also saw like latency, like P90 latency drop down by 50% just by doing an update. Um, and we were, we basically just picked up all of the changes, like the small incremental changes that have happened over you know, a six month period. Uh, also the reason why we have such a stable uh, resource usage here is because these queries are used to execute um, recording and alerting rules. So they're constantly executing queries. Um, and the load on them is about 16,000 queries per second. Um, all right, so now maybe just final th um, words about the Thanos community. So with the intro and all the exciting new features and the work we've been doing uh, to constantly improve the Thanos project, I also want to quickly share how you can get involved uh, with the Thanos community and how you can get involved with these efforts. Um, so our major project communications uh, communications happen over the CNCF, Thanos, and Thanos Dev Slack channels. Um, for code or bugs, issues, feature requests, we usually use GitHub. Um, we discuss on the issues and PRs on the relevant repos. Um, and you can also raise GitHub the discussions as well. We also have bi-weekly community office hours um, on Thursdays at around 2 p.m. UTC over Zoom. We maintain an, uh, a public agenda doc so that you can reference previous discussions and add in your own agenda items. And we usually try to uh, be present at KubeCon via talks, project meetings, booths, and this time we even had a country fest session uh, to on help onboard newer open source contributors. We also mentor pretty extensively in the CNCF. We try to submit projects uh, for the LFX mentorships, which happen nearly every quarter, as well as for GSOC, which happens like once a year. So please feel free to apply if you're a student or even if you're a full-time engineer who is looking to explore observability, monitoring, or the CNCF. We try to not only do some technical projects, but also try to provide some sort of holistic guidance to help them become greater open source engineers who are uh, awesome to work with. 
And finally, Thanos' website now has a dedicated space for technical blogs on the topic. So we'd love to hear your stories on how you are using or adopting Thanos. And if you have some nice use case for it, or even if you are using it as a, de- as a dependency to build something cool. Um, so feel free to share uh, this as this is a nice way to garner feedback from the community. Cool. Thank you. I don't know if we have any time for questions left. Sure. Yeah, there's one over there. Yeah, um, maybe just the mic. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I've got two questions. Um, so the one, the the the, the first one is uh, if every prom. Prometheus uh, are down. Uh, can we still use the Thanos with storage only? Uh, and the second one is: What is the order for request? Do we are we requesting um, first of all the storage, or are we requesting directly uh, the Thanos sidecars? Uh, yeah. So if all Prometheus are down, you can still query data from object storage. Um, and we usually request data from the sidecars, which then uh, talk to the Prometheus instances. So both the sidecar and the Prometheus are on the same query path. Um, and the uh, data is requested in parallel from the sidecar and from object storage, and it's kind of joined together at query time. OK, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, there's a question there, I think. Yeah, on the functionalities, the new functionalities you mentioned, in which versions are they uh, available or will they be available? So, um, with the exception of the distributed execution in native histograms, they're available in 0.31, so the latest release, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you can, like, always reference the change log for any specific feature. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, I have one question about the RAM usage for Prometheus. If uh, I'm converting to Thanos, because currently we have a, a multi-cluster setup where we have two uh, Prometheus instances, and they have very ri- high RAM usage because they ma- uh, monitor our GitLab runners. And we've seen sometimes Prometheus run out of memory, and then we have uh, holes in our queries because the data got lost because nobody uh, could ment- uh, could uh, save it. And d- uh, do you know how this uh, would change if we convert to Thanos sidecars and then to the Thanos query? Uh, like, how do you do you think the performance of Prometheus would change there? Um, so if you start uploading data to object storage, which is the easiest way to do it with the sidecars. You can reduce the retention in Prometheus, um, so that should help reduce memory. You also won't be executing queries inside Prometheus, which also increases memory. Um, And I think with those two changes, you should be able to at least bring the memory usage down to a bit. Yeah. Thank you. And the distributed execution would help, uh, I think, as well. Yeah, (laughs) definitely.